During spring and early summer, there is lots of pollen and other allergens in the air. These can trigger attacks of asthma and hay fever. Asthma and hay fever are the most common allergies affecting millions worldwide. And today, we're looking at ways of managing these common allergies. You may have experienced some of these symptoms like sneezing, wheezing, and itching. Alternatively, you or your loved one may have been diagnosed with any of these allergic conditions. Well, you're not alone. Today there are millions of people like you learning to control the symptoms of allergy. Today we discuss asthma, hay fever, skin and food allergy. Take a moment to learn how you can effectively take control of these conditions. I'm Dr. Salomo Daou and this is Health Talk. Asthma is a common condition affecting 1 in 10 children and 1 in 20 adults. Although it usually begins in childhood and half of those affected will outgrow it by adolescence, it can also occur for the first time at any age. I was 8 years old when I noticed I couldn't jump rope, run like my friends. I've been coughing, been wheezy, I, I sneeze a lot. It is estimated that as many as 300 million people of all ages and all ethnic backgrounds suffer from asthma and the burden of this disease to governments, healthcare systems, families and patients is increasing worldwide. is a major cause of chronic morbidity and mortality throughout the world and there is evidence that its prevalence has increased considerably over the past 20 years especially in children the cost of medication may be a financial burden for some especially in low socio-economic communities is the leading reason for the absenteeism at school and the fourth leading cause of absenteeism at work. Right, the medical field has made great strides in understanding asthma. Despite this, almost 300 out of every million South Africans die due to asthma each year. This according to the recently released 2014 Global Asthma Report is the highest mortality reported for this condition worldwide. Yet, asthma is, con is a condition that can be easily controlled and managed through correct medication. So, to help us understand exactly why is it that so many people die from such an easily manageable condition, is two special guests. Firstly, Dr. Roz Rabi, who's an allergy specialist, or sometimes called an allergist, in private practice in Johannesburg. And then we have Ms. Shua Hamilton Baloy, who is a parent of a child with um, allergy problems. Ladies, welcome to Health Talk. Thank you, Sir, Thank you for having us. All right, before we get to uh, Shuya, let, let, let's start with you, Dr. Ross. Um, we talk here about allergies. In simple terms, what is an allergy? An allergy essentially is an overreaction of the immune system. So if you imagine that our immune system is there to protect us against you know, injury and disease, the allergy essentially develops as an overreaction, so an allergen, so something that would yeah. stimulate the immune system, will irritate the immune system, and you may then produce an antibody to that. Right. 
Um, so that's essentially what we call IgE mediated allergic disease. Right. But there are actually other ways in which allergies can be mediated by the immune system. Yeah. Okay. Be- before we get there, now, you, you mentioned allergen. I mean, uh, when is it that something is regarded by the body as an allergen? For essentially, for example, um, for, for Sure's little boy. Yeah. His body overreacts to certain things, whereas yeah. you or I and, and, and Shreya herself may not overreact to that. Right. So, for example, grass pollen. Yeah. For most people, it's innocuous. It's yeah. not going to irritate the immune system. Yeah. But for allergic patients, the immune system is going to overreact. They're going to end up sneezing. They're going to cough. They're going to itch. They're going to have a, a runny nose, all kinds of different symptoms. Okay. So it's something that may be innocuous to many people, but for an allergic patient, yeah. it will drive the immune system to have an overreaction of sorts. All right. So talk about overreaction then. I mean, obviously, this overreaction then results in these conditions that we're talking about today. Absolutely. Let's start with an asthma. Tell us about how that it happens, actually. So in medicals, we def- def- medical terms, we define asthma as an inflammatory condition. Right. Um, so inflammation means swelling, it means mucus production, um, and in the chest particularly, it can then also have signs of wheezing or tightness that the patient may experience. So you find that patients with asthma um, generally may be reasonably well, but there would be certain things that may trigger the asthma for them. Okay, but explain to us what actually happens in the lungs that gives rise to these okay. symptoms that you're talking about. So you have the bronchioles, yeah. which are the, the thin the little pipes. tubes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. The thin air, air pipes further down inside the lungs, getting tighter and tighter. So they're getting swollen, okay, that's part of inflammation. Mm-hmm. There's mucus production, which then literally fills the little hole of the bronchiole. Mm-hmm. So it's tightening down and it's being filled with mucus and less air can pass through. Yeah. And the fact that less air passes through means that patient experiences tightness in the chest. We right. may hear wheezing. Yeah. Okay. And We're I actually see. showing it quite on the Absolutely. screen now, right now. So, so that air pipe there, that's right. Actually, it's because narrower, of that mucus, narrower, yeah, take us through. And thick mucus is collecting. Right. So you find that the patient may then cough. Right. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people think that, that asthma has to have a dry cough. No, you can see there's a lot of mucus produced during the, the inflammatory right. uh, reaction. Right. So they may even have a wet cough. So it can be a dry or a wet cough. Yeah. But the patient feels as though they can't really breathe properly. Right. And often that can be breathing in and or breathing out. Mm. As doctors, what we hear when we listen to the chest is, we may initially hear what we call an expiratory wheeze, so right. that wheezing noise on an outbreath. Yeah. But eventually, the, as the uh, an asthma attack may progress, you can hear that even on an in-breath. A very dangerous sign um, on a patient is when their chest is actually silent. Okay. That means the chest is closed down completely. Right. We'll, we'll get back to you know different grades, but at this stage, let me invite Shua. First of all, let me say that you know I I, I am truly thankful that you uh, agreed to be part of the show to share with us your experiences and i know that it's never an easy thing for someone to come share personal experiences on you know uh, on the public platform but thank you very much for accepting our invitation tell us about your child my son is four years old right and he has multiple he's got allergies he's got asthma and he has eczema as well Mm -hmm. so because we're talking about um, asthma the first time he had an asthma attack was last year in April. We'd taken him to school. He was a little bit sick, but not yeah. too bad that you'd want to keep him at home. Right. And then his teacher phoned to say that he wasn't breathing properly. And I rushed to the school and rushed him straight to Dr. Ravi. And that's where we discovered that he was having an asthma attack. And was, that it he f- was it the very first the time? The very that first ever time. Uh-huh. The very first time. Okay. And that's when we discovered that he had asthma. So tell us what, what, what you saw in, in the child when you got to school. He could hardly cry. He uh-huh. kept holding his chest and he was saying that it's sore, it's sore. And he wanted to cry. You know, children want to cry uh-huh. over something, but, but he couldn't. The, the sounds just could not come out of his mouth. Right. That worried me mm. tremendously. I drove very fast, but very safely okay. <laughs> to, to Dr. Ravi. Right. And he had to be put on oxygen when we got there. Right, right. Um, right. And yeah, he's been diagnosed with asthma well, since then. And, and how is he doing now? He's much better now. It, it, what treatment is he on? So he's on uh, Fox Air on a some, particular some pump. A pump. He's on a yeah. pump. Okay. He has an emergency pump and he has a maintenance pump. Okay. 
Dr. Ross, just let's talk about diagnosis now. How we, we've spoken about, you know, the symptoms and signs that, you know, uh, asthma sufferers can have. How is it diagnosed? In young children, it's a very tricky diagnosis, in fact. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons is because currently, um, in terms of how we diagnose asthma, for example, in adults, we would do that with something called a lung function. Yeah. Um, or on a peak flow where you yeah. suspect the patient isn't able to, to, to um, breathe out properly and then you measure certain criteria and you would then make the diagnosis of asthma. Yeah. But in young children that's tricky because they may not be able to perform these functions on, on a lung function machine or whatever. Okay, maybe, maybe <laughs> what, what we do because uh, you know, we, we're going to run out of time soon. Um, let's talk about the common triggers. Perhaps if you take us through, you know, how we treat asthma and take us through those common triggers, you know, that can result in an acute asthma attack sure. as it were. So essentially asthma is a chronic disease and it's a, what we call a chronic obstructive lung disease, but it's reversible. Right. So it would be reversible with certain medications and that reversibility is done through what we call short-acting bronchodilators and yeah. also known as reliever pumps. Right. And those are the I pumps think... they carry with them, like for example, when they exercise. Right. You, you, just, just there, you, you know, um, people know that there are two types of inhalers or pumps. That's right, yes. You know, yes. The, the relievers and the preventers. That's right. That's Please right. just take us through in very simple terms how, what the difference is between these two and what people should know about, you know, the importance of these two. Okay. So they're both important. Right. So your reliever inhaler you use certainly during an acute asthma attack. Right. Or, for example, when people are going to exercise and they're known asthmatic, sometimes we advise our patients to have that reliever and take two puffs of the reliever before they start to exercise because right. exercise can induce the chest to go tight. But then the most important, the mainstay of therapy is a maintenance inhaler. Right. And that they need to do every single day, whether they are well or not. Right. So we are human creatures, and right. when we are well, we don't take our medicine. Well, that is precisely the problem, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. Because, uh, and, and often you can't blame people. I no. mean, if, if you feel well, why do you need to go for pumps and you know, yes. pills and that sort of thing? So let's get back to you. How have you been managing? Well, I, I guess you're listening to Dr. Ross about the importance of these things. Are you, how's, how's uh, the control of the symptoms in your child? No. Well, it's been going really well. No. He understands. I think after he experienced going through an asthma attack, he, yeah. I didn't have much time to, con I didn't have to convince him to take his pumps. Um, it's getting a little bit different now because he hasn't had an attack. So now he's like, but why do I need to take it? I'm not coughing. And then I explained to him that this is to make sure that you don't cough okay. and feel right. bad later okay. on. So that's been okay. okay. We carry right. the pumps with us everywhere. Okay. I just need to ask this one question before, you know, uh, we run out of time. This notion that some children grow out of asthma, please comment on that. So we do know the scientific evidence to suggest that some children will outgrow their asthma. And that often happens around the time of puberty. Mm. So immunologically, what might be happening is that as they go through puberty and the hormones come in and they, they, they grow up into adulthood, that may have some kind of modifying effect. Yeah. But still, you would always watch somebody who has a childhood history of asthma because mm. they may, in some senses, in their 20s or 30s, have the asthma return. Mm, interesting. All right. So if you find yourself sneezing and reaching for the tissue box more than usual, then you might be suffering from hay fever. Stay tuned to learn more about this condition. After the break, we move to the nose and discuss hay fever. Enjoy your PlayStation 4 games on your smartphone with PS4 Remote Play. Don't settle for good, demand great. The new Sony Xperia Z3 Series.
Demand great and get the waterproof Sony Xperia Z3 smartphone with a 20 megapixel camera for only 499 Rand per month on a smart small contract this summer. Power to your best summer in 20 years. Vodacom, power to you. Zoom into Africa. This is Libya. The chairman of the General National Congress is Mr. Nouri Abu Samen. Libya got independent from Italy on 10 February in 1947. The population is more than 6 million people. One of Libya's major languages spoken is Arabic. Monetary unit Libyan Dinar. Do you have a runny nose, scratchy throat, and itching eyes, and yet it's not quite a cold or flu? You might be suffering from hay fever. <coughs> One in five people currently suffers from hay fever, which is linked to a potential life-threatening asthma. Hay fever is caused by an allergy to grass or hay pollens. Grass pollen is the most common cause and tends to affect people every year especially in spring and early summer. Another common allergen, mold, is usually found in damp areas such as bathrooms and basements. Hay fever does not pose a serious threat to health, but it can have a negative impact in the quality of your life. People with very bad hay fever often find that it can disrupt their productivity at school or work. If you have a persistent hay fever, nasal sprays and eye drops are available to help ease your pain. It is also important to consult your doctor. Okay, so hay fever or allergic rhinitis is a very common condition affecting many people in South Africa. It is called hay fever but has absolutely nothing to do with hay, nor is it always associated with fever. Spring and early summer is the most miserable time for those who suffer from this condition. Now, let's welcome a special guest to our show, Dr. Mtutuzeli Nyoka, okay. who's going to explain to us, enlighten us about this condition. Yeah. And Dr. Nyoka is an ear, nose, and throat specialist or an ENT specialist um, in, in private practice in Johannesburg. And of course, we still have um, Shua Hamilton um, Baloi, who's a parent of a child with allergy problems. And in this case, we're going to be talking about hay fever. But before we get to that, Dr. Nyong, just take us through this. <coughs> Firstly, this word hay fever, where, where, was, where does it come from? Hay means dry grass. Yeah. So hay fever is dry grass fever. So it's a yeah. pollen from the grass. Yeah. That's yeah. basically it. Yeah. Okay. So that's why people call it hay fever, because the early association was that only pollen yeah. causes hay fever. Right. But obviously we've identified a number of allergens number and of dust is another major allergen as well. All right. But that's historically where the name hay comes from. It oh, means okay. literally dry grass. Okay. Yes. Right. Well, take us through what actually happens in the nose then. Again, as Dr. Ross was saying, it's, yeah. an, it's an overreaction to certain substances in the environment that you inhale. Yeah. The two common substances is dust and pollen. Right. We call them major allergens. Right. So that's why in spring, yeah. the incidence peaks. Right. Because that is your um, pollen season. Right. But the dusty area, sun on, on, a, on, on sports day, yeah. any dusty area, dust will trigger right. the symptoms of, uh, of, of, of hay fever. Yeah. What, what happens in your body as you are exposed to these allergens, yeah. the body obviously will produce certain chemicals, yeah. a number of chemicals, the right. most important which is histamine. histamine right. I want to mention that because yeah. the drugs we use are called antihistamines. And, correct, yeah. And the histamine will latch on all, you know, several, the, the different organs, the way it will latch on receptors. It can be the skin, right. in which case your, 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 your son will have eczema because right. histamine has latched on the receptors there. Right, right. It can be in the lungs yeah. and cause bronchospasm and then you've got asthma. Yeah. In hay fever, it latches onto the nose, the, the receptors in the nose, yeah. the natural receptors, and it'll cause running nose, itching, 
and block nose. Block nose. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and obviously because it's the same airway that starts in the nose right down to oh, the yes. lungs. So okay. there's this close association between hay fever and asthma. asthma that they can coexist. Well, they coexist because the physiology of the condition is the same. Right. Hay fever can coexist with eczema. Right. It's the same disease. Right. A lot of the kids have got allergic conjunctivitis, their eyes are puffy, so yeah. it's hay fever in the nose. Yeah. So allergy can manifest itself in different organs, All right. but at the end of the day, it's one condition okay. at a physiological level. Let's talk about the triggers now. I mean, we yes. mentioned you know, the most common being pollen, grass, yes. dust, and so on. Yes. Um, any other, uh, for instance, I mean, uh, um, this whole notion that it's, it's a seasonal condition, that you only get it during certain seasons. Not only, mostly. Right. But there are non-seasonal sufferers. We call them perennial sufferers. Right. We see them a lot. Yeah. But obviously the incident peaks during, during springtime because okay. that, is your, that is your pollen season. Right. So it can be perennial. You, okay. you may at certain times need to be on medication right. every day of your life, every year, if you're a perennial sufferer. Right. But if you're a seasonal sufferer, that's not necessary. You only use the medication yeah. during the season. Okay, we'll get back to the medication because it's, yeah. it's quite important. There's, there's some differences here with, yeah. with asthma that we need to get into. Just in terms of onset now, we, we, we know that in, in asthma, it normally starts in childhood. Mm -hmm. Is it the same? Can the same thing be said it, about It varies. Asthma? You know, the body has got so many variables. The yeah. human body, it, it's, it, most of the time, you can pick up the signs earlier on. Right. I've got parents who've got children with hay fever, yeah. and they've never had the symptom until they're in their, in their 40s. Oh. So the gene is always there, right. but it does not express itself yeah. in a common way. Yeah. In yeah. certain people, it doesn't express itself at all. At all. You find yeah. that you have a family history dating back to your parents and grandparents. Yeah. Your children have got allergy, yeah. you don't have it. And the gene yeah. never expresses itself for your entire life, but it's there. Fascinating. Talk about parents. Well, let's, let's hear from a parent now. Your child having hay fever. Firstly, how did your child present? What, what, what exactly did you notice in your child? A really runny nose, um, watering eyes, a lot of sneezing. So uh, spring is a very interesting season in our house because every single person except myself in the house has got the, the runny nose, the sneezing and so on. Yeah. So that's how it presented. But, but you know... Coming to uh, Dr. Nyoko, the sneezing and the runny nose. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's lots of other stuff that can give you sneezing and runny nose. Now, how can a person tell that, no, this is not just common cold or flu, and this is now hay fever? Please take us through that. You see, with, with, with allergies, the pattern. First of all, you've got a, you've got, you'll have family history. Right. And this is something that will be going on for quite a while. Yeah. There'll be other things that you're suffering from other than sneezing, for instance. Yeah. We talked about the the eyes. Yeah. You know, you have the itchy eyes and sometimes they've got bags in, un, un, underneath the eyes. We call those allergic shyness. Yeah. And then there will be the scratching of the nose. Yeah. We call this the allergic salute. Yeah. So there's usually other things that make the... Di the diagnosis is a very simple clinical diagnosis. Okay. I've never done a single test for yeah. allergy in my practice because yeah. it's such a, it's a simple clinical diagnosis. Right, right. But it, it's clear. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. will be certain cases where you're not certain, but most of the time it's very clear. Okay. Let's talk about complications. Yeah. Um, what happens if hay fever is not treated? What happens if a blocked nose is not unblocked? That's a very important question to ask because right. a blocked nose, chronically blocked nose, leads to sinusitis. Right. Now, sinusitis literally means you've got pus in your sinuses, mm -hmm. pus in your head. Now, pus in your head can spread to the brain. I've Dangerous. seen tragedies right. where somebody says, I don't need to treat my hay fever because I've lived with it all my life. Mm. That's the worst thing you can say. Right. Because the complications are life-threatening. Mm. That person, people come in in a coma and they never come out of it ever. Because Scary the infection stuff. has moved from the sinuses yeah. into your brain. Mm. And sinusitis is one of the commonest causes of meningitis in the world. It can give you brain mass brain uh, abscesses as well. Mm -hmm. So my advice to my patients, it doesn't matter how much used you are to your al allergy, yeah. to your sneezing, yeah. take your treatment. Right. My advice to the parents, put your children on treatment. Right. Now the other complications of course is that the blocked nose is associated with the ears. The ears, right. Hay fever gives you 
ear infections, middle ear infections. In a child, when they've got that, poor speech development, they don't do well at school, but then ear infection has got its own life-threatening complications because it can also give you meningitis, mm -hmm. intracranial complications. Yeah. So it's a serious condition. Yeah. Much as you think the initial symptoms are mild, right. the complications can be quite serious. One practical question here. Um, people often say, you know, if your nose is blocked, it's often not easy to get the medication into the place that it's supposed to be, that people, in fact, often advise that you need to turn your head upside down and what have you. What advice do you give to people with regards to delivery of nasal sprays? Well, stuff? use the spray because the sprays that they have in, 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 in modern times, they produce a fine mist, right. which gets so easily dispersed into the areas where it's supposed to go. Yeah. You need to use the spray, unfortunately, to unblock that nose. Right. So, use so, so similar, similar to asthma, you need to use the, the one that unblocks, but on a daily basis, you need to use the one that prevents attacks. That, that, that's, the, that, that's what the medication does. It's got yeah. dual motion, uh, what you call uh, effects. Right. It, it gets rid of the symptoms, and it also prevents them from coming. Okay. Yeah. Ever a need to take tablets? Well, I mean, we combine the sprays often. Yeah. The spray is a steroid spray. Yeah. The tablets are the antihistamines that I was talking about. Right. That's the main chemical that gets released, among others, yeah. during allergy. Yeah. So antihistamines are so useful yeah. in yeah. terms of, especially the irritating symptoms like sneezing and itching, etc., etc. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, I use it as a, as a combination, a sp yeah. steroid spray in the morning and an antihistamine at night. Okay. I use it at night because antihistamines mostly yeah. can yes. cause sedation. Okay. Well, Dr. Nyak, look, this has been a fascinating discussion. I wish we had a lot more okay. time. Well, thank you very much for your contribution. All right. Now, is your skin prone to itchy rashes and you just can't figure out why? We'll learn some of the common allergies of um, affecting the skin, including a few surprises, by the way. After the break, there's a discussion on skin allergies. It's a favorite minister here. Yane, party is a very nice language because it was written by you, the people. Here's a good one. Try hard, an individual who prize against all odds. Try! Give me water! There's one for all you Bry hearts. Get a case of Cousin Light Lime for only $169.99 and help make party South Africa's 12th official language. Top set spa, shake things up. The skin is the largest body visible. Now, whilst it protects us against infection and solar radiation, the skin is also a sensory organ sensitive to touch, temperature, pain, pressure, and itching. Now, this organ can be affected by allergens in various ways, commonly resulting in conditions that we know as eczema and eticaria. Now, to learn more about these conditions, we welcome back Dr. Roz Rabi who's going to enlighten us on skin allergies. Okay, we, we've spoken now about how allergy affects the airways, the nostrils, the lungs. Let's talk about the skin now. Firstly, we hear this contact dermatitis, allergic dermatitis, urticaria. Please take us through the difference between these conditions. With pleasure, Selo. So um, the 
commonest one that we tend to see in an allergy sense yeah. um, is what we call atopic dermatitis, yeah. otherwise known as eczema. So essentially dry, weeping skin. Mm -hmm. But I, I must stress that not every kind of eczema is allergy, yeah. okay? And not every kind of allergic reaction is eczema, yeah. okay? Or not, um, not every rash is allergic. That's true, too. Yeah. Okay. Mm. The, the other common form of an allergic type of skin reaction is, as you mentioned, contact dermatitis. So, yeah. for example, um, uh, people who use household cleaners may find that once they've been using that product, then their skin may react and it may be peeling and itchy and so forth. So mm. that's more of a contact type of thing. So, so, so this reaction is actually where the offending chemical, if you like, absolutely. touched the skin. Absolutely. All or right. the ladies who get the nickel allergy from the allergy. You know, they wear their earrings. Every time they wear those specific earrings, they, they, they get an eczematous type of rash right. um, or dryness or peeling. Yeah. Um, that's right. Necklaces, Necklaces, belt buckles, those yeah. sorts of things. Okay. And then you mentioned urticaria, which is mm -hmm. a slightly more serious and perhaps less well understood um, skin reaction. So urticaria can combine with something else called angioedema, but not always. Urticaria, the Afrikaans word is bommels, and the English word is hives. So hives, essentially, yes, yeah. you're coming up with a rash, um, you can see there on the monitor, yeah. um, uh, large areas, it's red, it's, it's a little swollen, it's above the surface of the skin, and actually when you as a doctor feel the skin, you can feel that swelling even penetrates deeper down. Yeah. Extremely itchy. Um, yeah. The patients sometimes even describe as feeling unwell when yeah. they have an episode of urticaria. Why do you say it's dangerous though? Because if it is combined with the condition called angioedema, yeah. um, you can have patients who react. And urticaria can be a manifestation of a life-threatening allergic reaction called anaphylaxis. Right. So those are indications that maybe these reactions are a little bit more severe. Yeah. And they often can also indicate other problems in the immune system, not just allergy. Okay. So this urticaria, is it widespread or is it... It can be localized to yeah. certain parts of the body, yeah. but most patients find that it tends to spread. So yeah. it's almost of a creeping nature where it yeah. starts in one area and then it moves. And often the edge of the urticaria has, um, an, a, 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 it looks like a snake. Yeah. So in, 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 in fancy English, we would say sepiginous. Yeah. So it looks as though it's a moving snake right. along the skin. Yeah. Um, I'd but like us to come back and talk about why uh, with eczema, for instance, you know, it affects the flexures uh, in, sure. in, in children. But before that, let's ask the mom. Your child, what sort of conditions has he got, you know, affecting the skin? Is it, were you told that it's eczema or, or which one is it? And he's got eczema. All right. Um, started out as when he was a small baby. You know, there's baby acne. A lot of babies will have baby acne, but his didn't resolve. And eventually we realized that this is actually eczema and we took him to see Dr. Ravi as yeah. well as uh, just to check how we can sort it out and work on the eczema. So okay. it's itchy, he, he struggled to sleep, it would be in the creases of his um, arms, behind his knee, um, all over his back. It was a very interesting time um, having a baby who was constantly uncomfortable. It was actually very hard as a parent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, We've spoken about triggers for all these allergic reactions, but in terms of eczema now, I mean, it, it might be slightly different to other stuff. Please, please just explain this to us. No, you're quite correct. So with, with eczema, um, the triggers is often the dryness of the skin. That's often the driving force of the eczema. Right. So the um, very, very important way of managing eczema is moisturizing the skin. Right. And we often stress to parents and, and caregivers that they've got to re-moisturize during the day. You can pay 10,000 Rand for the most expensive moisturizer in the world and it will only last six hours on the skin. Mm. So, and uh, you know, dermatology colleagues, I think as well, and pediatric colleagues will also stress to parents that they've got to keep re-moisturizing the skin. So dryness of the skin is a big factor. Yeah, but simple things that can moisturize the skin, that's not as expensive. You know, when you mention 10,000 rands, mm -hmm. people get a bit no, of a... No, I mean, I'm uh, exaggerating. Yeah, but I'm no, saying I understand. That, that yeah, yeah. You, you know, you can go to the extremes and it may actually not work. Yeah. So, so there are a number of products around, um, yeah. but essentially... Um, 
anything that does not contain soap is important. Right. So sodium lauryl sulfate is essentially soap. So products that contain that often also aggravate eczema. Mm -hmm. So to, to try and find a cream or a moisturizer that actually has none of that in yeah. there because that will worsen your eczema. Now talk about creams and ointments and stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's often a problem. Uh, clearly what you, what you just said now in terms of triggering, you know, um, flares of, of eczema, if you like, you know, sure. being a problem. But also parents going out to try all sorts of stuff because, uh, I mean, uh, maybe let's, let's get it from here. I mean, yes. how, how did that affect you? I mean, did you see the need to, to want to get rid of this itchiness? Yes, I yeah. mean, we have a baby who couldn't sleep properly because right. he was itchy so much. So right. um, you try, you're a little bit worried about using steroid creams. You yeah. hear these stories about how it thins out your child's skin and you don't want that to happen. So you hear, you hear about different types of remedies yeah. that you should perhaps try because it's just, everything you're doing isn't working. So you want to try all these different things. Yeah. Uh, so yes, yeah. you're under a lot of pressure to try something different. Okay. So in that situation, that Dr. Rose, uh, what's your advice to parents? How, how should they treat a child that's showing signs of a rash? I think you must get the right diagnosis first. Because yeah. um, as we said, a rash can be anything. So I think you need to get the right diagnosis. And then you need to understand the disease process. So another common trigger, for example, would be wool. So we always advise parents not to dress the baby in woolen fabrics because that also irritates the skin. Um, when the baby sweats, when the child or the adult even sweats, yeah, even uh, emotional upsets can actually trigger the flares. Mm -hmm. So it's about managing the disease holistically. So it's moisturizing. You may need those cortisone creams from time to time, but we do try to avoid doing it you know, on an ongoing basis. Um, you may find there are now other uh, agents that we use called calcineurin inhibitors, which we use particularly on the face, for example, for facial yeah. eczema. Okay. Um, but All right, we, we're going to have to just hold it there for a moment. Okay, so now people often go out dining to enjoy some good food, you know. But for some people, though, choosing the food that agrees with their system can be a nightmare. Coming up after the break, we look at food allergies. know the hype is about the new cap and how about the new cabinet uh, will actually perform but what role should then the media be playing at this critical stage I, I would hope that media will give the newly appointed people a benefit of the doubt has the media lost its respect in this regard we want you to tell us the many factors that are hidden from the public in terms of this ought to be brought out by the media watch media monitor with me alicia jolly sundays at 9 a.m only on the sabc news channel Zoom into Africa. This is Libya. The chairman of the General National Congress is Mr. Nouri Abu Samen. Libya got independent from Italy on 10 February in 1947. The population is more than 6 million people. One of Libya's major languages spoken is Arabic. Monetary unit Libyan Dinar. We all enjoy a wide variety of foods, some healthy and of course some not so healthy. Some people cannot tolerate certain foods for an array of reasons. There may be psychological reasons for avoiding certain foodstuffs based on past experience or no experience at all. Or there may be a more serious reason such as allergy to certain foods or their preservatives. Some people may experience life-threatening allergic reactions to certain foods, by the way, which if not treated urgently may lead to death. Now, how would you know whether or not you have psychological food intolerance or food allergy? Well, let's invite comments from Dr. Rose again to enlighten us on this. You know, uh, people 
uh, you hear all sorts of stories about food allergy, food intolerance, and that sort of thing. First of all, maybe just clarify the difference between uh, being intolerant to certain foods or being uh, allergic to certain foods. So when you look at things like a food intolerance, for example, yeah. it may be that you are not able to fully digest that particular food. Right. So a very common one would be something um, that would be lactose intolerance. But yeah. true lactose intolerance is actually extremely rare. The patient doesn't produce enough of an enzyme called lactase to break down the lactose. Yeah. So when they ingest it, for example, in dairy, then they may end up with an upset tummy. Okay. But food allergy is something quite different and potentially life-threatening and more serious. Right. So in, in allergy, we talk about the allergic march. Yeah. And the allergic march very often starts with small children. Yeah. And you may then have the eczema, like Shira's little baby presented with eczema. Yeah. It often goes on to food allergy, allergic rhinitis, and then asthma. Or yeah. they may all develop at the same time. Yeah. Not all four conditions happen in every patient. Why the march, though? Why, why the term march? The march is essentially as disease progresses. So as the allergic disease and condition progresses, yeah. hence the march. Okay. And there are a number of theories around that. One of them is something called the hygiene hypothesis. Yeah, tell us about that. Yeah. The increase in allergies worldwide. It's becoming yeah. a global epidemic. Yeah. Um, and it's thought to be that we're living in too sterile or cleaner world. We have smaller families, so less siblings. We're tending to live in peri-urban or urban areas. So if we all grew up on a farm and had 10 siblings, um, the theory and the thinking is that our immune system will be directed against infection to protect us against infection. Some people mention cesarean sections yes, uh, being absolutely. the culprit as well. Yes, T tell and us antibiotics why? early in life. Yeah. So there are various factors, and I know Dr. Nyoka mentioned genetics. So we know that there's a very important interplay between the genetics, so the genes we inherit from our parents, yeah. and the environment. And that interplay is called epigenetics. Yeah. So the environment can actually switch on or switch off genes. Okay. So you may inherit the gene for allergy from your parents, but you yeah. may not develop it because you have sufficient vitamin D or you have other reasons that are protective for you. Yeah. So the march is essentially what we follow in children where one allergic condition falls into another. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, the common types of foods that people react to, you know, often you're told that people either react to those foods specifically or the preservatives used, you know, okay. in the uh, preservation okay. of, of, of the food, yeah? What, I, what I'd like the viewers to understand is that you can have um, uh, allergic reactions to the preservatives and colorants. That yeah. certainly does exist, and we, we're very aware of that. I have a patient who literally is allergic to wine, and sadly, she works in an events well, industry, well, so that's very it is, sad. Must be, must be happy. <laughs> <laughs> However, the commonest ones are egg, milk, peanut, tree nuts, um, and fish and shellfish. Yeah. Soy is also very common, and wheat is common. Okay. And we have emerging allergies that are coming through. So in South Africa, sesame seed allergy is becoming more common. Yeah. And in areas of the world, particular food allergies may be common for cultural reasons. So, for example, in um, Thailand, people eat fire ants as part of their diet. It's a delicacy. So there's a high incidence of, of allergy to fire ants, for example. Okay. But, but maybe just, let me just invite a comment from uh, Shuya. Uh, your child now, what foods is your child allergic to? That's a very long list. Um, hmm. Egg, fish, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts. Yeah, but, but why do you say, well, has that been established Yes. Because ch kids, kids uh, you know, can be quite selective when it comes to food. To what they want to eat. Yeah, and a yeah. lot of people think that. Um, a lot of people think we're just being fussy with yeah. regards to what he can, can yeah. and cannot eat. Yeah. But he's, we've actually had uh, skin prick tests done yeah. to establish his allergies as well as blood tests. Yeah. So but but what, what, did you notice something? How, how were you able to say, now I can see that my child is allergic to X? Okay. Peanuts. So you, you did you mention peanuts? I did say peanuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when he was about, so there's two reasons. When he was about six months old, we gave him a biscuit um, that had been manufactured in a factory that uses peanuts, and he reacted. So yeah. that was our first indication. How, how did you react? He started swelling. He was coughing a bit. Yeah. The nose was running. He was itchy, right. and we had to give him an antihistamine, and right. we took him to see Dr. Ravi the very next day yeah. after speaking to her on the phone. That was yeah. the one side, and on the other side, he he refuses to eat certain foods. And after, so for example, bread, he'll never eat bread. But now we've tested him and he's allergic to wheat. So with okay. him, it's more than just fussiness. Dr. Ross, 
it's often very difficult to determine what exactly uh, people it is that they are allergic to in, in, in foods. Let's talk about skin testing now, because sure. that, that's one area that's been a bit controversial. Is there a place for allergy testing? Absolutely. So the gold standard worldwide is still skin prep testing. Okay. It's been well validated. It's been around for over 100 years. Um, and you'll find that you know whether we're testing somebody in South Africa or Botswana or Canada or Australia, we're tending to use similar products and we will get the same results. But isn't that the problem though? I mean, it, does it mean that worldwide there are these common allergens worldwide that yes. cause your reaction? Absolutely. So worldwide, those top seven or eight will occur anywhere in the world. Right. Um, but we do know it's a lot more complicated than that. As I mentioned at the beginning of the program, um, you can have what we call IgE-mediated allergy, where you produce the antibody to the allergen. That's your immediate reaction, like Shreya's little boy had immediately eating the biscuit. So within 10 minutes to two hours, you swell, you itch, you wheeze, your nose may start pouring. Children will often complain of a sore tummy. The hyperactive child will go quiet, or the quiet child may, may become noisy. Um, and, and that potentially can then become an anaphylactic reaction. Yeah. But there are non-IgE mediated reactions, and those right. are the patients that react six hours later, two days later, and you can't make the connection. Yeah. That makes it very hard. Right, right. The, the reaction, obviously, um, is always allergic type that you mentioned? No, now, not always. Not always. Not okay. always. So for I want us to just focus on, you know, this family going out to a restaurant and the child is allergic or the parent is allergic to nuts and uh, makes that, you know, well known to the chef or the waiter. And for some reason in the sauce, uh, there's some nuts that were put in there. Take us through anaphylaxis and shock and what the possibilities are that can happen to this person? So usually, Cello, your anaphylactic reaction is that IgE mediated immediate type reaction. Yeah. And the patient may complain of um, various things. They may complain of scratching or itching in the throat. The throat may then start swelling. They may come up in a rash. That's common, but not everyone will get the rash. They may complain of itching. Not everyone gets itching. The chest gets tight. Eventually what happens physiologically is that your organs will actually start shutting down. Mm. And one of them obviously late stage would be a collapse. Okay. Mm. So one way in which you can manage anaphylaxis, even when it starts very early on, is what we call an adrenaline auto-injector. Right. The so-called EpiPen. Tell us about that. Well, in South Africa, we only have EpiPen. Right. There are others available worldwide. In the UK, they have something called Jext. Yeah. So um, essentially, it is a pre-filled syringe of adrenaline. Okay. Mm. So adrenaline is a World Health Organization essential drug. Every country should have adrenaline available. I'm not sure if you know that. In fact, in South Africa, two, three months ago, there was actually a shortage of adrenaline, oh, which is shocking. Okay. Scary so stuff, every yeah. doctor's office, every hospital, every clinic must have adrenaline available yeah. for this kind of reaction. So it's a lifesaver, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. It will save yeah. that patient's life. Yeah. This has been such a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much, ladies, for contributing to our show. You're most welcome. All right. It is on that note, sadly, that we come to the end of our show today. If you'd like more information on asthma and allergies, you can contact the Allergy Society of South Africa at telephone number 021-447-9019 or visit the website at www.allergysa.org and if you have the time there's a, an advocacy uh, group, allerg patient allergy ad advocacy group that you can google and find on FaceTime to get you know more information. So on that note, please join us again next week on SABC News and you can watch our repeat slot at 10 p.m. tonight. So for myself, Dr. Salom Daung and the rest of the crew here, it's a very warm goodbye. Thank you very much for watching us and have a fantastic weekend.
really know the hype is about the new cap and how about the new cabinet uh, will actually perform. But what role should then the media be playing at this critical stage? I, I would hope that the media will give the newly appointed people a benefit of the doubt. Has the media lost its respect in this regard? We want you to tell us. The many factors that are hidden from the public in terms of this ought to be brought out by the media. Watch Media Monitor with me, Alicia Jali, Sundays at 9 a.m. only on the SABC News Channel. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. Mandela is one of the Mandela granddaughters.